Good evening. It's good to be back with you this week. And we're going to continue our study and uh, biblical understanding, biblical interpretation, if you will. Uh, the big fancy word is hermeneutics. We've looked at the importance of, of the original language, knowing what some of those words mean. We've looked at parts of speech and, and uh, how figures of speech play into things. Uh, just like in, in our language, they color what we're saying. Today we're going to look at another very important aspect of biblical interpretation or, or understanding what the text is saying. Uh, and it's the importance that culture plays in understanding the Bible. We need to understand the culture that they were living in and uh, some things when they're saying them, uh, how, how that uh, plays into things. So I'm going to start out in John 2, and I'm going, to, I'm going to look at a statement that Jesus makes, and actually it's a, it becomes a very, very controversial statement, but I want to, I want to dig back through that and, and uncover some, some things that will help us to have even a better understanding of what the people were, um, were saying. So in John 2, this is after Jesus uh, does his first miracle and he's at the first Passover in Jerusalem and he's debating with the, uh, the folks after he has overturned the, the tables and, and cleansed, cleansed the temple uh, then answered the Jews verse 18 uh, and said unto him what sign showest thou unto us seeing thou doest these things so now you have to understand, Jesus has came into the temple. He's, he's disrupted everything in there. He's, he's uh, turned over the tables of the money changers, and he, he sent everybody out uh, with all the things that they were selling. And so now the people that's there are saying, what sign are you going to show us that, that you're, you're proving that, that you're Jesus Christ, or that, that you're the Messiah, basically? Verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. All right, so he makes this, this statement, and they're going to they're gonna come back with another statement. Uh, verse 20, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was the temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days. All right, so they didn't understand what he was saying. But let's dig back the layers of that just a little bit, and let's talk about this temple mount and what's going on there just a little bit. Before I do that, I want to push forward to the crucifixion, to when Jesus was uh, getting ready to, he was on trial, he was getting ready to be crucified. In Matthew 26, verse 61, this is what the... Uh, the witnesses that were trying to uh, give a word against him said, and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. All right, so now this is what they're trying to accuse him of, to crucify him. This is what they're trying to, what charges are bringing against him. In Mark's gospel, we get a little bit more information. Mark chapter 14, verses 58 and 59 we heard him say, I will destroy this temple. Now, he didn't say, I will destroy it. He said, this temple, if you destroy it, okay, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I'll build another made without hands. But then 59 gives us the explanation of why they didn't do anything with that. But neither so did their witness agree together. In other words, they, one would tell one thing, and then they bring another guy in there, and he'd tell something else. But I want you to see it's all about this temple at that particular moment in time. They didn't understand he was talking about his body. So what is so special about the temple now? And about where the temple was built? I'm glad you asked. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. We find this particular mountain the first time. And he said, this is Abraham, uh, no, and no, this is God. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Where's Moriah? 
Well, the Temple Mount is built on Mount Moriah. Okay? So, he says, Get thee to the land of Moriah, and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay? So, this is the mountain that uh, Abraham actually took Isaac up and offered him on this mountain. Matter of fact, <clears throat> the uh, Islamic, the Muslim folks that actually hold control of the Temple Mount right now where that Dome of the Rock is, there's a rock inside of there, and they say that that's where Abraham offered up the two. Uh, oh, Ishmael. They, they, they believe it was Ishmael who promised them. And uh, but they, they they say that that's where he was offered up to. It, uh, again, uh, we see this mountain. But the story don't stop there. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, David had numbered the people against God's will. And God brought a plague upon Israel. And so when the angel's hand was stayed, David went and bought a present for from a Jezebite by the name of Gerenah. This is going to be the same place where, and now David, if we go over and read it, he, he it's right outside the northern wall of what would have been David's Jerusalem. He went right outside of there. He bought this area, this threshing floor. He bought the, the oxen and the, and the sacrifices and offered all those sacrifices right there. Right there on Mount Moriah again. Then Solomon, years later, is going to build the first temple. Okay. Uh, first Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1. Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. So this is, again, this is that place. This is where he offered that at. And then verse uh, 2, And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel and set the mason to do rocks and stones and build the house of God. So again, this is where that first temple was built. On Mount Moriah there. Alright? Then we have Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount what? Moriah. Where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of On Arnon, the Jezebel. Okay? So this is the place David bought. This is the place that uh, Abraham offered up Isaac. This is the place where Solomon built the first glorious temple. Well, the temple was uh, took Solomon seven years to build, and then it was destroyed by the Babylonians before the Israel went into uh, captivity. Then there was a decree of C uh, uh, Cyrus, and Ezra the priest was sent back to build the temple, a place to worship. Right? You remember that story? Anybody remember what happened when, when the people saw the little temple there? Oh, they mourned. The old people mourned. Oh, this is the light that's all of this temple. Oh, look how beautiful this is. They cried and they, they mourned. Later on, several hundred years later, Herod the Great. He made an uh, agreement with the Jews that he would make this a more elaborate temple. And what he did was they started laying the foundation. He, he, he had all the priests uh, uh, cleanse to where they can go and work on the Temple Mount. All right, so let's stop a minute and talk about that. Why do you think that Israel don't just go up there and take over the, the Temple Mount now and build the temple? Any idea? They have to have a red heifer. 
that has no more than two white hairs on it. It is three years old. And then they kill that red heifer. And they take the ashes of that red heifer mixed with water and a hyssop. And they have to anoint the high priest to cleanse him. He has to wait seven days. And then he can take the same ashes and he has to cleanse the workers that are going to work on the temple mount. They cannot take a chance at going into the Holy of Holies where that's supposed to be located if they are not clean. And it will desecrate the Holy of Holies and God will strike them dead. Remember what he did when that, the wrong one touched the... Yeah. So, again, they take that very seriously. So, what happened was Herod... He had, he had a bunch of priests cleansed where they could go work on the, on the Temple Mount and they started laying a new foundation. And they laid the Holy of Holies and then they started working on the, the, the new temple before they ever took the old one down. And it's called the, the temple that Jesus would have seen when he was alive here on earth would have been Herod's temple. Okay, that would have been the one. He started work on it in 20 AD. And it did not get completed until 62 AD. How many years ago? Hmm? I think it's that. Yeah. yeah. 40, 40, 42, 43 years. All right. So it took that long, eight, it was eight years prior to uh, the temple actually being destroyed. It was finished eight years right before it was destroyed. Now think about this one. Every time Jesus went to the temple when he was on earth, there was always some kind of work project going on. They were still building it. Every time he was all right, so that, that's that's something there. Titus, a Roman general, son of Caesar, uh, he is he is the general that was over taking over Jerusalem whenever uh, seventy A.D. was there when the uprising took place. He was the son of Caesar. There's two stories that circulate about Titus. Okay, so now now we're getting to why we need to know all this information. Okay. So there's two stories that circulate about him. One is that he he actually challenges his men to take over the Temple Mount where the Jews are held up. Uh, held up. They've locked the temple and they're putting on a fierce front and he says, you know, I'll give a reward to whoever takes it over. There's another story that circulates and says that he gave a command not to destroy the temple because it was so beautiful with all the gold and stuff on it. It's gold overlay. What was Jesus' prediction on this thing? Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the, the building of the temple. <clears throat> And Jesus said to them, See you not all these things, all point to the building? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. Alright, so what happened now, this building gets, uh, catches on fire, one way or another, whether they set it on fire, or whether it was a fire that started through the fighting. But there's a fire, and the gold melts off the sides of this thing because it's it's over the uh, it's limestone overlaid with gold. And so it melts. And what they done was they pried the stones loose so they could get the gold out of the stone. Jesus prediction not one stone will left be left upon the other that's not thrown down was fulfilled in 70 AD, all right? Do you see the importance of knowing something about the background of what's going on as you're reading the story? 
I mean, there, there's so much uh, about all of this. Uh, going back to, to Jesus, he, he says, I will raise this up in three days. And these people are saying, it's been 42 years. How in the world are you going to uh, raise it up in, in just a few days? And uh, they didn't understand he was speaking the Bible. All right? So now that's one thing. The temple is, is one thing that, that we need to understand when, when we're looking at the New Testament, especially the gospel. Another thing that we need to uh, talk about or, or think about is the publican. Who are the publicans? Does anybody know? We see them here on April 15th. Yeah, they were the tax collectors. And the publicans were seen as sold, uh, sellouts. And so that's why they were a byword. I mean, that's, that's over and over again, we see it in the, in the Gospels that they're a byword. Well, what happened was, if, if I was a Jewish person back in Jesus' day, I could have went to Rome and I could have uh, told Caesar, I would like to uh, charge the taxes for Randolph County. He said, well, what are you going to give me? Well, how much taxes do we need, Randolph County? Oh, well, we need uh, $100,000. All right. So then I would come and set up a, a way to collect taxes. I could, I could tax everything I wanted to tax. I could tax this road out here. I could tax the water. I could tax the land you live on. I could tax the air you breathe. I could tax everything. Like that. Remember, Matthew was sitting in what? A booth. And he was taxing a particular road at that booth. All right? Well, what the... What the people of Randolph County would see about me is I'm charging more than what I needed to charge. Because, see, any, I could charge as much as I wanted. Then I get to keep all the extra. So if, if Caesar needed $100,000 and I, and I could gain a million and a half, I could keep the million and almost a half. The million four hundred thousand. I just had to give him 100000 and so they were seen as, as ruthless criminals. They, people hated them because they, they, they had the law behind them, but yet they were actually working against the people. Two examples of them would be Matthew and Zacchaeus. Both of them were, were tax collectors. They were both of them were public. Another place uh, that we could talk about is is uh, a funeral. All right. Jesus gives the cost of discipleship in Luke chapter 9, and I think it'll be showing right here behind us. So we'll just look at this. We'll talk about some of these different things that's going on, but we'll try to focus on the funeral itself. Jesus has, he's collected up disciples, okay? And in verse 57, and it came to pass, that as they went in the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever you go. Okay? And so Jesus looked at him, and this guy, he was a, uh, a lawyer, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, That's the first principle behind sold out discipleship is, is we don't own anything. I mean, we, we, we're traveling through this world. And our Lord, he just traveled through this world. And if you're going to be sold out discipleship with him and you're going to go wherever he, he goes, then you're not going to have anything permanent. You know, and, that, and this guy here, he wanted something permanent. Verse 59, he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. Do you think his father was dead? 
Yeah. But no, that's not the case. In her culture, he's probably the oldest son. And he's saying, let me go collect my inheritance. And then I'll follow you. Okay. What does Jesus tell him? He says, let the dead bury the dead. Right? But you go preach the kingdom of God. You see, so often when we're talking about discipleship, and you just go back to the to the funeral here for a minute. When we talk about discipleship, there's always these things that we think is more important. We need to get in line before we can actually start serving God. But God's saying, look, you start serving me now. You start serving me now. These things will come to pass one way or the other. They'll come to pass in their own time. But the time to serve me is now. All right? And so, verse 61, there's another guy coming to him. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. <laughs> oh, man. And Jesus said to him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So, so what he's saying is, is your commitment's back at these people more than it is to me, because that's why you got to turn around and go, go tell them goodbye. And once he goes, he's not going to be able to follow him no way. He, he'll just stay there at home. He'll find some other reason to, to hang around. There's actually examples of that in the Old Testament. Okay? So, then there's a, the second coming of Christ. And I, I want to deal with this, I guess, verse by verse here. This is in Matthew 24, verse 32, where we're going to start at. Jesus said, Now learn a parable of a fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. All right? So just not read nothing else. What what is he saying there? I mean, what what is he saying? Just in common sense language, what is he saying? Yeah, the season's going to come about, and there's signs that you know because you, you're able to read these signs. I mean, uh, won't be so many months, <laughs> and we'll start having some blooms come out, you know, and, and we'll know that spring is just around the corner. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. So he's going to give you some things to look for, and then he's going to give you some things that's going to happen. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, Know that it is near, even at the doors of the things that he's already talked about. Verily I say unto you, this generation, what generation is that? Please help me with this now, because there's people that misuse this, this verse right here. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. What generation is he talking about? He's talking about the generation that is alive when the things that are start taking place back in Matthew 24, I think about verse 3, where he starts talking about all the things that's going to happen during the tribulation period. All right? When there'll be wars and there'll be famines and, and all of those things, he says, you're going to know that my coming is near because these things are taking place. Just like you know that spring's near when the fig starts throwing out its fig leaves. Once these things start happening, this generation shall not pass away. Now, listen to this. There's people that say that in May 1948, when Israel became a nation, that that's the fig tree throwing out of her leaves. Okay? And so that's the sign we know Jesus is going to come before this generation's over. What's wrong with that? Though? That generation's almost all dead. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so it wasn't, that was not the sign that he was talking about. Does that make sense? But there's a lot of people that still hold on to that. 
Okay? But that was not the, that was not the sign that he was talking about. He was talking about all these things that happened during the tribulation period. So now look what he says. Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. No one knows that day or hour. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, and know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah, Noah was, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what were the days like? All right, so, so just look at it now. What were the days like? The days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage. So what does he say? Was he saying everybody was stoned and drunk? No. He's saying life is just going on. They went over to Dixie 3 and they got them a meal just like they did last week. You know, uh, they, they went over here and they, they, you know, they went car shopping and they 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 were planning a wedding for their, their daughter and, and life was just going on. And then Noah entered into the ark and the flood came. And that's what he's saying. He's saying just like that. Just like that. That's going to be the way it's going to happen. Life is just going to be going on. It's just going to be going on. And all of a sudden, bam! It's going to be there. But it's not going to sneak up on you because I have given you these signs to be looking for. Alright? So, they knew not until the flood came, verse 39, and took them all away. So shall uh, also what? The coming of the Son of Man be. This is not the, the coming of the Son of Man is not the rapture of the church. It is the second coming of the Son of Man. It is the second coming of Jesus to the earth. Okay? Now look what he says. This is the way it's going to be when he comes. There shall be two in the field, and one's going to be taken, and the other left. There's going to be two women, and, and actually, do you see up there on the screen, women shall be? Oh, it's not, it's not. Well, it, yeah, you see it in the in the parentheses there. Back up a little. You see it in the parentheses there? That means that that little statement's not there. It says, two grinded at the meal. That's, that's the, that is what the Greek said. Two grinded at the meal. Not two women should be grinding at the meal. They put that in there because they understood grinding at the meal would be women's work or slaves' work. It would not, men would never be grinding at the meal. But I've got news for you. Is there a time when men were grinding at the meal? Gideon. Gideon was grinding at the meal. Okay? So, so there is examples where men were grinding at the meal, okay? Anyway, two should be grinding at the meal. One should be taken and the other left. All right, so, so let's talk about grinding at the meal for just a second. So we're going to have two out here in the field. They're going to be whatever. They're either going to be hoeing their tomato plants, you know, uh, side to side. One's over there in that row, one's over here in this row, and they're mowing. You're going to have two grinding at the mill. You had a wheel, and it took two people to actually turn this wheel, and it would actually grind the mill. And so there's going to be two, and one died. Okay, so there's people that always said, this is the rapture of the church. No, this is how many people are going to be gone. How many people are going to die during that time period. It's going to the people that in our life or in their life during the tribulation period, they thank God. It's going to be so rare that you're going to be able to keep everybody that you know. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be what we want. Two thirds of the people on the planet die. That, that's a huge number. Two thirds of the people on the planet are going to die. And so that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about how many people are going to die. Verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched 
and would not have suffered the house to be broken up. So, what is he talking about with a watch there? What is a watch? You know? Huh? Okay, but there's. Okay, that's true. But in their culture, see, now that's what we're going back to. Their culture, they was it was three watches in the night. Okay, so yeah, they were divided up in four hour increments. And so if he knew what watch he was coming, he had been up during that time period. You see, and so again, knowing something about the culture helps you to understand the actual text that you're reading. You, you see. So, if you knew which one of the segments that the thief would have come, he'd have been up. He'd have had his, he'd have had his butcher knife out ready for it. All right? Verse 44. Therefore, be ye also be. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man coming. So, in what watch you think he's coming, he's not going to be there. Verse 45. Who then is faithful by his servant? Whom his Lord had made ruler over his household to give him meat in due season. Bless the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his good, but of that evil servant, uh, he shall say in his heart, My Lord is his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. An hour when he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion of the hypocrite, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so again, he's talking about a day of reckoning, and he is, he is given, in my opinion, he's given the Jews the uh, the warning that they need to be busy about what they're doing. But I think at the same time, we can apply that to the church. We need to be busy about what the Lord has called us to do. Wait, that's got to be the application of that. All right. One more thing I want to deal with, and then we'll be gone. Okay? Running before the king. This right here makes about no sense. When you read this particular text, this is in 1 Kings chapter 18. This is the account where Elijah is on uh, the mountain. And, and uh, the prophets of Baal are there, and they're trying to get uh, their God, they're trying to get Baal to uh, answer their call for fire to come down out of heaven. And, all right, so what is Baal? Does anybody know what Baal is? What kind of God is he? He's the God of thunder. So he's the God of, of rain. He's the God of... Uh, of uh, uh, oh, uh, fertility. He was, he was the fertility God. He was the God of rain. And so that was why the challenge was given to them to call down fire from heaven. If, if Baal is God and he's the God of fire, he ought to be able to light this place up, right? All right? So that was that was the reason. But you know what happened there? Uh, he, they were not able to call down fire. All right, but look at 1 Kings 18, verses 45 and 46. And it came to pass, in the meanwhile, that the heavens were black, and the clouds and wind, and there was great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Now, he's riding in his chariot. That's, that's what he's in. This is after uh, Elijah kills all the prophets of Baal, and, and he has uh, defeated the prophets of Baal. Now look at verse 46. And the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before, ran before Ahab to Je, uh, the, the entrance of Je, Jezreel. Now why in the world would this prophet that just destroyed all of the prophets of Baal and uh, decimated Ahab's character why would he run in front of the chariot? What would possess him to do that? This is a good lesson for where we're at right now in America. Okay. 
Ahab, Ahab was God's chosen king. If, if Elijah would have left things the way they were, the people would have probably rose up against Ahab and seen him as a false king and killed him. But by Elijah, the one that just brought this great victory to the Lord God, by him girding up his loins and running in front of the chariot 14 miles in the rain. He was paying homage and great honor to Ahab as the king. Because the kings would, they would actually have runners going before their chariots and before their horses that showed their kingly ship. Yeah. And so here he is, he is, he is doing that very thing. He's running before him. Ahab had been humiliated by this defeat. The people would have taken this as a sign of killing. But Elijah running before his chariot, he did him honor. He was acknowledging his right to rule given by God. All right? That's something, that, like I say today, and that's hard for me to say, but that's something today that we've got to acknowledge whoever comes out as president in January, we've got to acknowledge that they're the president of the United States. And we've got to pay honor to whoever that is because it's God's particular person. All right? That makes sense? All right. I got one more. I told you I lied to y'all. I seen that today. Somebody said, when the preacher says, I won't be long today, Facebook checked them and called it uh, uh, false news. Okay? There's a guy, his name was W.M. Thompson. I would highly recommend if you look this guy up and, and uh, look up his book. He had a book that he wrote in 1859 called The Land and the Book. He was a Presbyterian missionary to the Ottoman Empire. While he was over there in the 1800s, he did a pilgrimage all the way across uh, the whole Middle East over there, and he, he wrote it all down in this book. This book was the second best seller in its day. The second best seller. There was only one book that sold more copies when it was published. He has an excerpt from when he was in Tiberias. And he was sitting and he watched all of these shepherds or whatever you want to call them drive in all of these oxen and donkeys into town. And once they got them inside of the gate of the city, you know, the city had a wall around it, they just left them alone. And every one of these oxen and, and uh, donkeys found its way back to its home, to the owner that was there, that, that belonged to it. He said he wanted to see if Isaiah chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 was real, and he said he saw it play out right there in Tiberias. Listen to what Isaiah said. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. <coughs> but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. All sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corrupt, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to the anger. They're all gone backwards when we're doing all backwards again. And what he's saying is, is these dumb animals know more about who owns them and where they belong than the children of Israel and who owns them and where they belong and what they're supposed to be doing. Isn't that a challenge to us today as well? God knows who we are knows we belong to him, but so often we wander off somewhere we're not supposed to be. And these poor animals know more about who feeds them and looks after them than we do. All right. Culture is important. 
And this is just a, this is just a put your finger in it. I mean, there is so much in the Bible that when you read, if you can learn something about the culture, there's books out there that talks about the culture. Edershine has a great big old book called The Life and Times of Jesus Christ. That's a good book that will help you with his culture. There's others about the times of the Romans. But these things will help you <coughs> glean more out of, out of the text itself and, and help you to have a, a better understanding. All right. so let's pray and let's go on. My Heavenly Father, Lord God, we want to thank you for this day. Father, I thank you so much for again for the opportunity to be here to teach. Lord, I do pray that whether it's the people in here or whether it's the people on the internet, that they glean something out of this that will help them in their Bible study and help their them their understanding of Scripture. That they might come closer to you and know more what you expect out of them and what you have for them. Father, keep us all safe as we go home. Bring us back this coming Sunday looking for you to show up.